Hello, A family. Welcome to Devo time. And uh, we hope you've been getting incredible things out of this growth book. You know, Easter just passed, but an incredible time. And in the Bible, based on where we are at right now, the book of Mark, chapter 16, we're still in the glory. We're still in that time. Jesus has died, but Mark 16 is all about he's alive. The resurrection of Jesus. This is an incredible time. This is why our faith means something. Paul says that if Jesus did not raise from the dead, our faith would be in vain and everything we preach would be in vain. There'd be no need to have services, no need to be preaching a gospel, no need to travel around, no need to try to be convincing anybody of anything. Because if our God is dead like all the other ones, why would we be talking about him? But our God is alive. Hallelujah. So Mark chapter 16, this is a very, very short chapter, which is great, which means I can just read through it with you. Once again, the purpose of these overviews that we do this video for for your week is not to give you all the revelations. We want you to be given that, getting that for yourself. We want you to be seeking God. We want you to be writing these things down in your daily growth book, everything that you're getting. What the purpose of this is for is just to give you an overview of maybe the chapter, a couple pointers that, we'll, uh, you know, that I'll say today. But I'm not going to in any way give away anything going on. I want the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And we're going to read through this, though, from the beginning to the end. There's only 20 verses, so we get to do that today. Starting in verse 1, Mark 16, verse 1. Let's go for it. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, Who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. Note that real quick, very large stone. Um, so uh, I have a, a friend um, who grew up with us, uh, but she lives in Israel, and she does the tours in Israel. Uh, and takes people to all the places, the garden tomb and all those things. And she actually went up to one of the tombs and they have one, a stone that was placed in those times. She actually was pushing up against it, trying to really move it. And uh, it was so massive, she wasn't budging it. And that was with her whole body, multiple bodies. It's going to take multiple grown men to try to move this tomb. And those angels did it in a flash, you know, and uh, Jesus just rolled away that tomb with his power, the resurrection power. And that power is the Holy Ghost that's inside of us. Hallelujah. Verse 5. As he entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. So <coughs> remember that not every single angel has massive wings. <coughs> there are five different ranks of angels in the Bible, just like there are five different ranks of demons that are in the Bible. But every single rank has a different uh, employment, a different job. Um, and some of these angels, they basically, the Bible talks about how uh, when you're uh, taking care of strangers or when you're blessing somebody, it said, always do it aware because unawares you might be entertaining angels. So these people wouldn't be people that have wings. They'd be, look like you and me, but they would be, um, something's different about them. I mean, but they could literally look just like you and me. I, I know many people have had encounters and uh, just crazy stuff happened. And so pretty cool. So this was just a young man. It looked like a young man, but he was dressed in a white robe and he was standing next to it. They were alarmed. And then he says, verse six, don't be alarmed. He said, you are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. I love this next sentence. He is not here. He's not here anymore. Hallelujah. Right? Where is he? The right hand of the throne of God sitting in heaven. We're going to go over that in a little bit. See the place where they laid him, but go tell this disciples, all of his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. Let's just notice real quick when he says, and Peter, why did the angel have, make sure that he declared Peter's name and not every other disciple? It's very important to know this because remember, Peter had denied Jesus three times. Peter was feeling pretty terrible at this point. Peter had totally betrayed Jesus when he said, if all of the other ones betray you, I never will. But Peter did. He actually denied him three times before the rooster crows. We know the story. So the angel makes sure he says, tell all the disciples and Peter. I want you to really make sure that, that Peter knows Jesus is alive and make sure that Peter 
comes and believes and sees this. I love it how Jesus wanted to make sure that Peter was involved in this because Jesus knew what Peter did. Even if Peter was like, oh, the Lord didn't hear me or he didn't know because he was being crucified or taken and beaten at the time, the Lord saw everything. But we're going to see an incredible thing in one of the other Gospels. It talks about how the Lord actually got Peter to say three times. What did he do? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Three times he gets Peter to say, you know, I love you. Why? Because three times he had denied Jesus. He wanted to completely restore Peter, and he did it in a conversation. You see, here's a great point to know, guys. Even though Peter failed, Jesus did not build a monument to Peter's failure. He came, he forgave Peter, but he got him out of it. He actually worked him out of it. He said, do you love me? And he got Peter to say they loved him three different times. And then he said, if you love me, feed my sheep. You want to show your love to Jesus, take care of the people that he loves, take care of his children. And it's just an important thing to note. If God is not building a monument to your failures, then why are you? If Jesus is not spending every day going over the guilt and shame of your past, then why are you? If Jesus isn't bringing it up anymore because the Bible says he separates your sin as far as the east is from the west, then why are you still doing that? Remember that when you're saved, the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all sin. And it's said that he will remember no more your sins. It doesn't mean God totally forgets. He's God. Of course he knows. But he causes himself to not remind himself of it. He causes himself to never remember it. He won't bring it up anymore. So remember, you're the only one bringing up your past to the Lord. You're the only one bringing up your failures to God. He's moving on. He's ready to go on with your future and give you a new hope. Remember that. Verse 8. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Afraid of what? Well, they had just seen an angel. There was nobody in the tomb, and they knew Jesus was in there. So they're running. They're literally in shock is basically what this is. They're in total shock, so they can't talk to anybody else. They're running. They're fleeing out of fear and excitement, a mix of it. They're like running so fast. You can just imagine. They're just freaking out out of total shock and fear of what they just seen and also just excitement. Like, could the Lord still actually be alive? <clears throat> Verse 9. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. Don't you love that? That the first person Jesus appears to is a woman, number one. Number two, it's a woman that he drove demons out of. And we know the story, it's not in this gospel, but it's in another gospel as well, that remember that he just, he says her name. And she didn't recognize him until he had said her name. And she recognized him because of the sound of his voice when he said her name. That's a very intimate, beautiful concept right there. Verse 10. She, being Mary, went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, listen, they did not believe. That's number one. Okay, so all the people she tell, they don't believe it. Let's go to verse 12. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form to the two of them while they were walking in the country. That's the two on the road to Emmaus. Remember, Jesus appears and tells them everything about themselves. Once again, it's a different gospel. And it's that their hearts burn within them. They sit down to have a meal and he, poof, he's gone in front of their eyes right the moment they recognize him. Um, and that's he said. They were walking in the country. These returned and reported it to the rest, those two men. But they did not believe them either. So we got one group. They don't believe it. The next entire group, don't believe it. Two eyewitness accounts, those two don't believe it. Let's keep reading, verse 14. Later, Jesus appears to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he was risen. Do you know that's still happening today? Do you know that many are seeing Jesus? Many are giving their lives to the Lord. Jesus is making himself real to them. And they go and eyewitness account about it. But it's not just saying it. Many of these people get saved. They have evidence. Their drug addictions are gone. Their hatred is gone from their hearts. They're able to forgive when they never could forgive again. Those are our testimonies. But I just want you to know that even the most powerful testimony in your life does not mean that somebody's going to believe. You have to leave these things in God's hands. You have to say your testimony. You have to 
Preach with all of your might what God has done for you. That's our job. Them believing is not your job. God is working on people's behalf. But just know that your testimony matters and that God is speaking to people. But just your testimony might not make them believe. They have to have an encounter with God for themselves. That's why praying for your family, praying for people you know who do not know the Lord is never a wasted time. Because when they can encounter God for themselves, they will believe. So when Jesus comes and encounters them himself to these disciples, what happens? They believe. Verse 15, then he says to them, all of these disciples, go into all the world. Preach the good news of all creation. What does he tell you to preach? The good news. Does he tell you to preach your own opinions? No. Does he tell you to preach something that you heard in some book? No. Does he tell you to preach what this other person said? No. He just wants you to preach the good news. you got to find out what the good news is. If you don't know it, it's right here in this book. It's the good news about Jesus. Paul says we're preaching the good news. And what is the good news? It's the good news about Jesus. We want to be speaking Jesus all the time. Verse 16, whoever believes this good news and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. You believe it, you get saved. You don't believe it, it's so sad. You have to believe in the Son. There's no other way to be saved. You have to believe fully. You have to commit your life to it. You have to fully give over yourself to believing that Jesus died on the cross, he rose from the dead, and then he's alive and he's in your heart wanting to help you through life, and you will be saved. Verse 17, this is so good. And these signs will accompany, or another version says, will follow all those who believe the good news. Okay, not just believe anything, but believe in Jesus and the good news. Here we go. Here's five signs. Every single one of you believers who are watching me right now, if you are a believer of Jesus, that means you believe he died for you, he rose from the dead, you believe the good news. So these signs should be following you in your life. You should be seeing these. It doesn't mean you're an evangelist. It does not mean that you are a pastor of a church. It means that you're a believer. It is not reserved for people who are evangelists or pastors or teachers. These signs I'm about to read are reserved for every believer. That includes you. Number one, in my name, pause there for a second. All of these are not legally able to be accomplished without the legalization of Jesus's name. He is the authority that gives these things that I'm about to read legalization, the legal right to happen because you have spoken his name. Remember, these signs are not given to you because of your name. These signs will not follow you because you're awesome. These signs will not follow you because you are just the greatest thing ever. And you have all these followers on Instagram and Facebook. These signs follow the name. Did you get that? They follow the name of Jesus. His name has earned these signs because of what Jesus did in the previous chapters on the cross. Now, if we use his name, isn't that amazing? If we use his name, even though his, for, his actual body, his physical body is not here, we can use his name and his name still induces the results that his physical body, if it was here. Can you think about that, how incredible that is? Like, think about, for instance, the President of the United States. If the President of the United States is not with you, you're like, well, I can't get all those things. But what he can do is if you know the President of the United States and he says, just tell them my name that I sent you. Tell them uh, I'll put my name on a card for you or a note. Just give them the note with my signature, right? Give them my signature. They'll let you into any building. They'll let you into any dinner. They'll let you into any place because you have my signature. You have the power that is behind my name. Now, they say, if I put my name on loan for you, I will give you the power and all of the influence behind my name. I'll back you up. I'll back your businesses up with my name. Uh, uh, that's what branding is. That's what, that's what sponsors are. They're putting their name behind something that you're doing. That's why your event will be incredible because, you know, Jeep puts their name behind you or this organization. They're giving you the power of their name to endorse your product or whatever you're doing. Jesus says, I give you my name on loan. Hallelujah. The power of his name is endorsed 
and that's where these things happen. Number one, you're going to drive out demons. Every believer driving out demons. You're not accompanying demons. You're not welcoming demons. We're driving demons out. That's what believers do. Number two, they will speak in new tongues. Now, please understand, this is not talking about just your prayer language. Your prayer language is something that every single believer should have. But speaking in new tongues means new languages. I could explain that some other time, but it's very, very powerful that you understand. We're speaking in new languages. We're going to be speaking in tongues, the language of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to be getting many rivers of that language. If you still have the same two or three words you've been speaking in tongues, there's more for you. God wants to unlock more for you. There's languages of heaven and there's languages of earth. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, I can speak in the tongues of men and of angels. So there's tongues or languages in heaven and there's languages on earth. And we can be able to access some of those heavenly languages here on earth. Number three, they will pick up snakes with their hands. Whoa. So we're talking about supernatural protection. That is now furthered by number four. They will drink deadly poison and it will not hurt them at all. So we got driving out demons, number one. We have speaking in tongues, number two. We have uh, uh, picking up snakes, number three. And number four, we're going to have deadly poison and it will not hurt us at all. Why is he saying that? Because he's intending on many of us are going to be traveling to places and going into areas that are not necessarily safe, um, doing things that most people would not do because the Lord's calling us into the darkest of the darkest places and areas that are dangerous where nobody else wants to go. But he's saying, I've already got your back. I'm going to take care of you if you'll just obey me. And number five is that they will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. Every single believer has the authority to have the sign of healing accompany them. Praise the Lord. Here's the last two verses. Verse 19. After the Lord Jesus has spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of the throne of God. Why is that important? Because Jesus physically is not here anymore. He's up in heaven at the right hand of the throne of God. Well, he's in my heart. Yeah, he is, but he's not, not the physical person of Jesus isn't in your heart. He's in your heart in the form of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. Jesus is God. God the Father is God. So the Holy Spirit <coughs> is Jesus in your heart. He's in the form of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. And that Spirit is in your heart. There we go. Verse uh, 20, the last one. Then the disciples went out and preached where? Everywhere. And the Lord worked with them in the form of who? The Holy Ghost. And confirmed His word by the signs that accompanied it. So listen, guys. You are not healing people. You are are not uh, casting out demons. Jesus is doing it through you. He is working through you. How? In the form of the Holy Spirit. He is accompanying you and helping you, the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus unlimited. Let me say it again. The Holy Spirit is Jesus unlimited. When Jesus was here, he's in a physical body. He was limited. He only was one body. He could be in one place at one time, but the Holy Spirit is Jesus unlimited. He doesn't have to take taxis, planes, anything. He can be everywhere all at the same time. He's unlimited. He is accompanying you to your job. He is accompanying you to your work. He's accompanying you to that conversation you need to have with your child. That's going to be a hard one. He's accompanying you every single day you wake up with your, your husband or your wife, the turmoil, whatever's going on in your house. He's with you. He wants to be working with you, accomplishing these signs. And who is the one who's confirming it? He's confirming his own word. As I close, please understand this. The Holy Spirit is not responsible for confirming anything in your life that is not His word and His opinion. He does not confirm your opinion. He will not confirm anything that you say. He will not confirm just anything that you do. It is only His agenda, His kingdom work, His word, and the things that He says that he will take responsibility to back you up and confirm. Never forget, as long as you stay with God's word, you are always relevant. As long as you stay with God's word, you will always be kept safe. And as long as you stay with God's word, preaching his opinions, not your own, then God will always back you up. We love you guys so much. Thank you today for this incredible time. Have an incredible time with these scriptures this week.
We pray you get a lot of revelation. Make sure you write it down. Say it with your groups. Uh, say it with each other. Get somebody to talk to it about. Remember, the greatest way to learn something is to read it and learn it and then teach it to somebody else. That's what really, really engraves it into your heart and your mind and causes you to really know it even better. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.